Hey there, guitar fanatics. Today we're going to talk about arpeggios. Now we can think about arpeggios as a chord that we break apart and play one note at a time, and they're incredibly useful for soloing and for creating interesting rhythm parts. Now, arpeggios have a great sound because we're basically playing every other note in a scale, and arpeggios sound open and airy compared to more scale type playing. And arpeggios are a key component of melodic soloing because if you play the right arpeggios, it's literally impossible to play a wrong note. But sometimes we struggle with arpeggios, whether it's conceptually or because there's so many shapes to memorize. I also see players struggle because they're memorizing some finger patterns, but they're not really understanding what it is that they're playing. And that makes it really hard to use the arpeggios to find and move them all over the neck and be creative with them. Today, I'm gonna to show you how to visualize both triads and seventh arpeggios. I'll show you some great ways to practice them. And be sure to stick around to the end because we'll even get into some tricks to turn arpeggios into amazing sounding licks. I'm glad you're here. I'm Charlie Long. Let's play some guitar. So let's get started by looking at what we call triads. As indicated by tri in the name, these are three note chords and arpeggios. And the longer I play, the more I realize that triads are really the true foundation of fretboard knowledge. Let me put it this way. If you don't really know your triads, you're making being able to move around the guitar neck way harder than it has to be. Because triads can serve as little markers or building blocks for rhythm parts or solos wherever you are on the neck of the guitar. Now to really understand triads, we need to take a look at the major scale. Now here's C major, which has no sharps or flats. That's gonna help keep this simple. So the major scale has seven notes, and C major has the notes C, D, E, F, G, A, B, and that brings us back to C, an octave above where we started. We also can and should see those notes as intervals, and we can give them a numeric identifier. So those notes would be C is the root, D is the second, E is the major third, F is the fourth, G is the fifth, A is the sixth, B is the major seventh. Now why is that important? Because as we advance as players, familiarity with intervals becomes infinitely more important than note names, in my opinion. Recognizing intervals, well, it's the whole point of ear training. And becoming familiar with where intervals sit in relation to other notes on the fretboard, well, to me, that's really the key to unlocking the neck of the guitar and being able to move around it freely. So, that's what we're going to learn today. To get a triad, we're going to make different combinations of intervals a third apart. And this is as easy as starting on a note, C for instance, which we would call the one or the root, going to the third note in the scale, which is E, and we call that the third, and then going to the fifth note in the scale, which is G. And that gives us a combination of the one, the three, and the five, C, E, and G, and now we have a C major triad. This is important, and what I say next will give you a perspective on how to identify the other types of triads and seventh arpeggios. It's a major triad because the distance between the root and the third is four frets or two whole steps, and we call that a major third interval. So C to E is a major third. Well, how about from the third to the fifth, in this case, E to G? Well, E to G, well, that's three frets apart. It's a step and a half, or it's what we call a minor third. So a major triad has a root, a major third, and a note, a minor third above that. Now, this is the basis for pretty much being able to identify all chords. Because by manipulating the third and the fifth, we get the other three types of triads. More on that shortly, but let's play some triad shapes. Now here's where things can start to get dicey. There are several different ways to play the triad because there are several different places you can play the same notes on the guitar. But how about, rather than seeing that as a frustration, we start to look at it as an opportunity. Check this out. So I want you to learn and practice triads like this. 
we're going to find a root note on the different strings and we're going to play a triad shape using our first finger to, on the root. We're going to use our second finger on the root and our pinky or sometimes ring finger on the root. And we're going to knock out that confusion of multiple ways to play the same thing once and for all. Let's start with the C note on the low E. And if I use my index finger for the root, I've got E or the third at the 12th fret. And then I've got G or the fifth at the 10th fret of the A string. And you need to imprint that onto your brain, that particular shape when we play a major triad on the low E string with our index finger on the root. How about using the second finger on the root? Well, then we'd have to play the third or the E at the seventh fret of the A string. And we've got G or the fifth, and that's still at the 10th fret of the A string. Burn that into your brain too. And lastly, if we play the root with our pinky, we need to play the third with our ring finger. And then we could play the fifth or the G at the fifth fret of the D string. So same triad, same root note, but three different shapes. And why is that important to know? It's because we never know where we're going to be at a given moment when we're improvising. And to be able to really achieve fretboard freedom, we need to be able to find whatever note we want to find wherever we are on the neck. Having multiple options to play the same thing like this, well, that's a big part of achieving that freedom. So let's move on across the fretboard now. We can use these same shapes with the root note on the A string. We've got C or the root at the 15th fret. If I play it with my index finger, the third's at the 19th fret, and the fifth is at the 17th fret of the D string. Again, those notes are C, E, and G. If we use the second finger on the root, the third or E is at fret 14, the D string, and the fifth is at fret 17. Pinky on the root, the the third's at fret 14 of the D string again, and we've got the fifth at fret 12 of the G string. Awesome. How about on the D string? Well, we've got a C or the root at fret 10. If we use our index finger, we've got our third at fret 14, and we've got the fifth at fret 12 of the G string. If we use our second finger, we've got the third at fret nine of the G string, and the fifth at fret 12. Now, instead of the pinky, we can use our third finger on the root. The third would be fret nine of the G string, and the fifth is at fret eight of the B string. How about shapes with the root on the G string? If we go to the G string, we've really got just two shapes to worry about. If we play the root with our index finger at the fifth fret, we've got the third or E at the fifth fret of the B string, and G is at the eighth fret. And we can use our ring finger to play the root on the G string. We got our pinky at the fifth fret of the B string. And we've got the fifth with our index finger at the third fret of the high E. Lastly, what if our root's on the B string? Well, we've got a C at the 13th fret. And we play it with our index finger. We've got E or the third at fret 17. And the fifth or G is at fret 15 of the E string. If we play the root with our second finger, then we've got the third at the 12th fret of the E string and the fifth at fret 15. So there are multiple ways to play the same arpeggio, working off a root note on each of the different strings, well, except with a high E, but changing the finger that we're playing the root note with each time. If you'll spend a little time getting familiar with those shapes, I think you might be shocked at how quickly you'll get them down. So what about other types of triads? Well, let's talk about minor. Now, the difference between major and minor triads is that we're gonna take the third interval, in the case of a C major triad, that note would be E, and we're gonna flatten it one fret. And then C and E flat would be three frets apart, and we've already said we call an interval three frets apart, a minor third. And we can go through all the same shapes that we just learned for major, flatten that third, and convert them to minor. Watch how easy this actually is. 
So here's our root on the sixth string. Here's the major form with the index finger on the root. I'm gonna flatten the third. And we have minor. Here's the root under the second finger. Flatten the third. We have minor. Root under the pinky. Flatten the third. We have minor. Now let's skip over the fifth string root because it's all the same fingerings. Here's our fourth string root. Shape with the index finger. Flatten the third. Shape with the second finger. Flatten the third. Shape with the ring finger on the root. Flatten the third. Here's our root on the G string. Here's our third, fifth, Flatten the third. Might have to change the way we finger it. Here again, now we've got our ring finger on the root. There's our major triad. Flatten the third, we've got the minor triad. Go up to the root on the 13th fret of the B string. Index finger, root, third, fifth, minor. Flatten that third, root, flat third, fifth. Here's the root with the middle finger. Major, flatten the third, and we've got minor. So I know I went pretty quickly there, but all we're doing is we're flattening that middle note, the third interval, one fret, and we can convert all of our major shapes to minor. And it really is as simple as working through that, putting in a little practice and a little memorization. So there's major and minor triads, and there are two other types of triads. We've got a diminished triad, and that's not a diminished seventh. Don't get those confused. And we've also got an augmented triad. Now to get augmented, we would take a major triad, and we're going to make the fifth sharp. So we take the C major shape with the root on the low E, fret it with our pinky. We've got root, third, and fifth. We're gonna move that fifth up one fret, and we get that sound, pretty interesting. And you probably won't use it a lot except in a blues like Stormy Monday. So how about diminished triads? Well, we're gonna take a minor triad version of the shape we just used. So we've got root, flat third, and fifth and we're also gonna flatten the fifth. That's the sound of a diminished triad. It's another one that you're not gonna use all the time, but you need to know what it is. Now that we've got shapes to play, let's relate those shapes to all the notes in the major key. Sticking with the key of C, remember we had the notes C, D, E, F, G, A, and B or the root, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh. And if we build a triad off each note, we're gonna get three major triads, three minor triads, and a diminished triad. And they are as follows. The triad off the root, it's major. We've already talked about with the note C, E, G. The triad off the second, or D, is gonna be minor. We get the notes D, F, and A. Uh, building off the E, we're going to get the notes E, G, and B. That's another minor triad. Off of the F, we have F, A, and C. Well, that's a major triad. Off of G, we've got G, B, and D. Another major triad. Off of A, we're going to have A, C, and E. That's minor. And lastly, off the B, we're going to get D, D, and F, which is our diminished triad. Now let's look at a couple of ways of practicing these through a key. We could practice them like I just did. We were changing the root note to each note of the scale, but I was using really the same arpeggio shape. I was using my index finger on the root note for each of the different triads. And we'd want to be able to fluidly play through those triads no matter which string set we were starting on. <laughs> So 
So that was moving horizontally up and down the guitar neck. How about moving vertically across the guitar neck and trying to stay in the smallest space on the neck possible? Let's start with the C on the low E string, and we're going to use the form where we play the root with our middle fingers. So here's C, C, E, G. Now I can play D minor without shifting positions using my pinky on the root note. Going to the A string, I've got the E under my index finger. Here's E minor. We've got F using our middle finger on the root. G using the pinky. A minor using my index finger. We've got B diminished using the middle finger. And lastly, we've got C major using the third finger. So there's all seven arpeggios in that key. I never had to shift positions. Sweet. So that's triads. Major, minor, diminished, augmented. Now we've got multiple ways to play them and we can practice them horizontally up and down the fretboard or vertically across the fretboard. Let's take things one step further, add another note to turn our triads into seventh chords. Going back to our C major scale, we have C, D, E, F, G, A, and B, or the root through the major seventh, like we said. Now to make triads, we started on a note, called it the one, and stacked the third and the fifth on top of it. So we're playing every other note in the scale, right? C major was C, E, and G. So to get a seventh chord, we're gonna add the seventh on top of that triad. So for C major seven, we had the triad of C, E, and G, and we're gonna put a B, or the seventh note of the scale on top, and that gives us a C major seven. Now to get D minor seven, remember our D triad in the key of C was minor, we would play D, F, A, and then we're gonna add a C note on top. And a quick note about sevenths. A major seven interval sits one note below the root. So here's C, B is the major seventh of C. It's one fret below C anywhere on the fretboard. But a minor seventh interval, like the C in D minor seven, well, it's gonna sit two steps or two frets below the root. So I've got D note at the seventh fret of the G string, C would be at the fifth fret. And again, that relationship is the same anywhere on the fretboard. Now, when we get to the fifth chord in a key, which in C major, it was G major as far as triads, we're gonna take that G major triad with the notes G, B, and D, skipping the E, we get the F note, now an F note is two frets below G. And we're gonna call a major triad with a minor seventh on top, a dominant seven chord. And we usually just see that notated as G7. Now the seventh triad, remember, was diminished. And if we add a minor seventh note on top of that triad, in this case, B diminished, we're gonna get the notes B, D, F, and A. And we're gonna call that arpeggio minor seven flat five. And we can practice moving these horizontally up the fretboard like we did with our triads. Let's try it on the low E with our pinky on the root. Here's a C triad with a B note on top. Here is a D minor with a C note on top. Here's E minor with a D note on top. Here's an F major with an E note on top. Here is a G major with an F note on top. Here's A minor with a G note on top. Here's B diminished with an A note on top. And we'd be back to C with that B note on top. Awesome, let's take that over to the G, B, and E strings using our third finger on the G string root. Here's C major seven, D minor seven, E minor seven, F major seven, 
G7, A minor 7, B minor 7 flat 5, C major 7. Now just like triads, we're playing them up and down the neck, you know it, we're going to go across the neck now. Let's start with a C major 7 on the low E string and we're going to play the root with our middle finger. Now D minor 7, we'd play the root with our pinky. E minor 7, we'd play the root on the 5th string with our index finger. F major 7, we've got the root at the 8th fret under our middle finger. Now G7, we've got G at the 10th fret of the A string under our pinky. A minor 7, we've got A at the 7th fret of the D string under the index finger. B minor 7 flat 5, we've got the B at the 9th fret of the D string under our 3rd finger. Lastly, C major 7, we've got a C note at the 10th fret of the D string and that root was under the pinky. So there's all seven of the seventh arpeggios in the key of C, and we stayed within the span of frets seven to 10, playing all seven of those arpeggios. Now that's the kind of fretboard exercise that will exponentially improve your fretboard knowledge and fluidity. It's invaluable stuff if you really wanna be a player. Now I promised you a trick for turning arpeggios into cool sounding licks. Now arpeggios, they sound great on their own, but sometimes I hear players relying way too heavily on just playing an arpeggio over the matching chord and doing nothing else with it. And when I hear that, I always think, come on, you can try a little harder to play something cool. So give this trick a try and see what you can come up with. Over the one or four chord in a key, so in the key of C, that would be C, C major seven and F, and F major seven. You could combine the arpeggios of that major chord and its relative minor to get some awesome sounds. So over C major seven, we would use a C major seven arpeggio and an A minor seven arpeggio. A minor seven is the relative minor of C, and that also works in reverse. Over A minor seven chord, you could use those same two arpeggios. And over an F or F major seven, we can make licks up using an F major seven arpeggio and a D minor seven arpeggio. And of course, again, that works in inverse. Let me show you a couple of examples. What if we take the A minor seventh shape with the A on the sixth string at the fifth fret, and we're gonna play the shape with our index finger on the root. So we'd have A, C, E, and G. Now, we can go to the C major seventh shape with the C root at the 10th fret of the D string. And I'm playing that with the root under my pinky. So we've got C, E, G, and B. And then just taking a quick look at the fretboard, all we have to do to combine the two shapes is after playing the G at the fifth fret of the D string in the A minor seventh arpeggio is slide into the A at the seventh fret. And now I've got access to that C major seven arpeggio. And here's where we can really embellish arpeggios and turn these things into what I call arpeggio-based licks rather than just running arpeggios. We're gonna play a few notes from the C major scale along with these arpeggios. So we're gonna play our A minor seven, slide into the A note, play C major seven, slide into the C note at the eighth fret, play D and E, pull off down to C, slide to the B note and hammer on C and D, pull off back down to B. So we have this little run. And then we're gonna descend through that C major seven and end up on the B note at the ninth fret of the D string. Pretty cool sounding lick. How about one more? Let's combine D minor seven and 
F major seven. So there's a D minor seven shape. I've got a C note at the fifth fret of the G string, and then we've got our D minor triad, and I can play the C note there at the eighth fret of the high E string. Now I've got an F major seventh shape, starting with F at the 10th fret of the G string. So, so far we've got this. And I'm gonna slide from the C of the D minor seven up to the 12th fret, that E, and descend through that F major seven shape. Next, I'm going to go back to the E or the seventh of F, and I'm gonna slide to the F note at the 13th fret of the high E, play D, C, and A. That's a D minor seven arpeggio. After that, I'm gonna play F at the 13th fret, slide to the G at fret 15, and then play F major seven with E, C, A, F, and E at the 14th fret of the D string. Great sounding lick. Well, okay, arpeggios, they're an awesome tool, and I hope you learned a lot from this video. Now, if you like what we just did, well then check out this video that's also about arpeggios, and I wish you the very best with your guitar playing. Work hard, play hard, have fun, never stop playing that guitar. Bye.